Welcome back to Homesteading with the Zimmermans, where we work hard and play hard on our little corner of land in Iowa. My husband and I were born and raised Old Order Mennonite, or Horse and Buggy Mennonite, as some refer to them as. And although we are no longer part of that culture or community, we are intentional about passing on the old-fashioned skills of our childhood to the next generation. Hello, welcome back to Homesteading with the Zimmermans. Today's video is all about our milk cows because I am part of the collaboration with the Inquisitive Farm Wife and the Mennonite Farmhouse. Those channels are co-hosting a collaboration called June is Dairy Month. And they will be doing a live um, drawing giveaway on July 5th. And the way you enter this giveaway is go into my description box and find the playlist of all the collaborators and then leave a comment. Copy and paste comments get booted by YouTube so those don't actually work. Um, but every comment you leave on the videos in the playlist enters you to win the grand prize that will be hosted by the Inquisitive Farm Wife on her channel on July 5th. So when I was first asked to be part of this collaboration, I initially declined because I knew that we would only be getting like a gallon of milk a day and that I wouldn't be able to make all the fun things with the raw dairy that I wanted to show you guys. But then in the meantime, we um, had the opportunity to buy a Jersey cow and her heifer calf from friends of ours that were downsizing their acreage. And so I contacted Leanne and said, hey, I am getting three to four gallons of milk a day right now, sometimes five, and I would be excited to be part of this collaboration. Now, milk cows are something that I grew up with. I grew up with a family milk cow. My husband grew up on a dairy farm. So milk cows are not new to either one of us but they're definitely the commitment was new to us because of course growing up it wasn't our responsibility it was the responsibility of our parents so about eight years ago is when we got our first milk cow and we have been through multiple milk cows since then and i have become very passionate about my milk cows and about raw dairy our number one reason for keeping a family milk cow is the amazing nutrition that it adds to our family's diet. And I've been known to say over the last couple years that I cannot imagine feeding my family without raw dairy and everything, all the nutrition that that adds to every meal and every snack. So the star of today's video is going to be cottage cheese, like a probiotic cottage cheese that has all the beneficial bacteria for gut health. And I'm also gonna show you how to make cottage cheese with pasteurized milk. So even if you don't have access to raw milk, um, you can still make cottage cheese. And then along the way, I'm gonna be showing you how we sanitize things and how we keep our stock tank clean and how we keep the flies off of the cows when we are milking. So mid-June on the homestead means that there is beauty and reasons to be thankful everywhere you look. There's lots of peas hanging on to the plants. And we've just begun harvesting our small row of snap peas for fresh eating and for snacks. We still haven't received any measurable rain in the last month or so. So we're using our soaker hoses and watering the crops that we need to preserve for winter. Things like carrots and onions and tomatoes and green beans and potatoes are getting deep watered about once every two weeks. Um, but the crops that we just planted for fresh eating, we're not worrying too much about those. Uno and her babies have come visiting the garden quite often lately 
and I try to pretend that they're just eating bugs, but sometimes it's obvious that they are eating my plants. Okay, moving on to the milk cows. So this is Brenda. She is a purebred Jersey and she is giving us between three and four gallons of milk every day. And then back here we have Gwen. She is a brown Swiss and she has been in milk for approximately two years now and we have struggled to get her bred through AI. So uh, we are in the process of drying her off so that she can go to the neighbors and be in the pasture with their bull. The reason we're not ready to give up on getting her bread again is because she has nice big teats and she's the perfect cow for the kids to learn to milk on because she's such a gentle giant. So Brenda and Gwen are our two cows that are currently in milk after we dry Gwen off and then it'll only be a couple weeks before Norma um, freshens and I of course will be showing that here on YouTube. And as you can see, we have entered fly season here on the homestead. And we have tried numerous different sprays to prevent the flies from bothering our cows. And some of them, I take one look at the label and I think if I wouldn't put it on my kids, I don't wanna put it on my milk cows. And then I have tried recipes and most of them use alcohol or vinegar as a base. And what happens is if you have biting flies, that means you have some um, bites on your cows. And if you use alcohol or vinegar, that is going to sting. And those recipes just weren't working for us because it made my cows more agitated than the flies. So we have settled on two very natural methods for fly control. And this one that you're seeing here is one of my favorite because in addition to needing to keep the flies from my cows, I also am always looking for chores to give my children a purpose in life and to make them feel like they are needed and necessary on the homestead. So when it's not fly season, the younger boys will sit on the opposite side of the cows and they will help us milk. But then during fly season, their chore switches from helping to milk to cutting a tree branch and swishing all the flies off of the cows. And I, of course, am usually so busy keeping my bucket between my legs and keeping it from getting knocked over and spilled by a restless cow that I don't take note of how the cows are enjoying being brushed with a tree branch. But when others have observed this method of fly control, they have been known to tell me that your flies have the, your cows are closing their eyes and look like they are in the best place in the entire world. So here you can see how bad the flies and gnats sit on my cows and how restless they become. One of the methods that I use when I am milking alone is just pure coconut oil. I just rub it all over their legs and especially their belly because the flies sitting on their belly is really what makes them kick and spill the bucket. I don't mind a little bit of shuffling of the hooves and a whipping of the tail when it's fly season but I really do not want them to swipe at their belly with those back hooves because that will send your milk bucket flying and your milk is going to be everywhere. Putting coconut oil all over my cows like this seems to give them some relief from the flies for two to three days depending on what weather we're having. So we just use a bucket of warm water and a clean rag to clean up our cows before we milk. Um, we are not super concerned about um, any bacteria or things like that in our milk. Um, number one, because we understand that the body's immune system helps you to become immune to bacteria and pathogens that you are constantly in contact with. 
if we have a cow that has laid down in a cow patty and we cannot possibly you know collect clean milk from her um we just milk her out and that milk will then go to the pigs but for the most part in the summertime anyway our cows are very clean because they walk around in tall grass that is covered in dew and they don't have access to every cow pie because they have such a big area so they rarely lay into a cow patty in the summer another difference with summertime milking is that instead of setting my bucket right below the cow i keep it tucked back between my knees because even though i have rubbed coconut oil all over her um, she's still likely to be bit by a fly here and there, which will make her move her legs just like that. And I want the bucket far away from those hooves to protect it from dirt and from getting spilled. So now I'm just stripping out the last bits of that milk using this method of milking and i also call this the stripping the cream because it's a known fact that the cream is the last milk that you get so brenda gets her grain after she's done being milked because otherwise if she eats while i'm milking she is entirely too restless and we are trying hard to keep brenda's body condition up so she gets some grain and some haylage when we are done milking. And then we head all the way back to the house with our milk. So back at the house, we have sanitized everything and are now straining our milk. So the number one reason we sanitize the jars that are going to store our milk is because of making hard cheeses. If I want to use this milk to make hard cheese, I want to make sure that there is no bad bacteria in my milk that could spoil my aged cheeses or contaminate my aged cheeses. Most of the time, sanitizing is not a huge issue for our family and we just make sure everything is washed well with hot soapy water. But because I like to make hard cheeses, I've started sanitizing all my jars that I put milk in because that way I have a much better success rate with making hard cheeses. And I will be showing you the recipe for this hydrogen peroxide mixture in a minute here. I also think this is a perfect example of you don't have to have the perfect setup to be able to process a lot of raw dairy because I just wash and clean and strain everything in my laundry room vanity that really is not set up for handling big quantities of raw dairy, but we make it work. And then after we've marked each jar with today's date, um, we put them into our refrigerator. We have a refrigerator in the garage that we use only for milk. So yesterday morning when I was filming the straining of the milk, I already had my sanitizing, my hydrogen peroxide sanitizing spray mixed up before I started filming because that's just um, routine what I do and I forgot that I wanted to film it. So this morning, I am going to show you how I make my sanitizing spray. And because hydrogen peroxide dissipates with water, meaning um, that it dissolves in water, um, I have to mix it up every morning to sanitize my milking equipment. And what I do is I keep hydrogen peroxide in this little squirter bottle, and then every morning, I, I have this bottle that has measurements on, so I put about five ounces of water, and in that five ounces of water, I want approximately one tablespoon, a little more, of hydrogen peroxide. So one of these is a fourth a teaspoon. So I need to put four, I need to put 12 droppers of this in, three. So you could also just use a tablespoon measuring cup, but I find this to be a little easier on my hands because if you spill it on your hands, it is gonna sting. Anyway, so then this is what I use to sanitize 
and by tomorrow morning the peroxide will have lost its sanitizing power so whatever i don't use this morning is then um useless but that's why i only mix like five ounces at a time to keep keep it active and here is another area where we use hydrogen peroxide on our farm when our stock tanks start looking like this which is about every two weeks in the summertime we add some hydrogen peroxide to kill off all the algae that is growing in there so i've got my peroxide here and i've got probably about a cup and a half i try to stay under two cups for my 50 gallon probably 55 gallon stock tank and i'm just going to pour this in and it usually takes about 24 to 48 hours for that to completely clear up I'm going to put a link in the description of this video giving more information on why our family chooses to use hydrogen peroxide over bleach as a sanitizer. So since we are still participating in the Three Rivers Pantry Challenge, I am going to be showing all the different ways that we use our raw dairy um, in our daily diet. So with an abundance of fresh milk also comes an abundance of fresh cream. And here I'm skimming all the cream off of a gallon of fresh milk because that is what we're gonna have granola and milk for breakfast. And I always skim, skim most of the cream off and you might think what's left is skim milk, but it is still far more whole than the skim milk that you get at the store just because I cannot separate it as well as a professional mechanical separator would separate the cream from the milk. Another one of our favorite things to do with the cream, besides making butter, is to add it to some fresh hot coffee along with some maple syrup and a pinch of salt. I find this to be the perfect after chores reward. One of my favorite fermented dairy products is kefir. And kefir is very similar to yogurt, but much simpler to make. And I just strain out my kefir grains, which it's actually the part of the milk that contains the bacteria. So you're introducing um, a beneficial bacteria to your milk. And then every day I just strain out the kefir grains and add some fresh milk to the grains and set it back on the counter and let it ferment. I cover it with a coffee filter and a rubber band. And then to the kefir, I add some strawberries. I might add a little bit of sweetener or some collagen powder and just blend it all up for a perfect breakfast. Another very popular breakfast at our house is yogurt parfaits. And I will link the video that teaches how to make yogurt in the description. And we make unflavored yogurt and then we just add toppings according to our preference before serving. Finally, we arrive to the portion of the video where I'm going to teach about making cottage cheese from fermented milk. And I warned that I was passionate about my dairy cows and raw milk. And I have been known to have to apologize for continuing to talk about my dairy cows, my milk cows, long after people are bored of the subject. So I'm going to start with two quarts of fresh skimmed milk. And then to that fresh milk, I am going to add a bit of last week's clabber that I saved. And you don't have to actually add clabber to your milk. You can just let it sit on your counter and it'll clabber on its own. But adding some clabber to it helps it to ferment faster. 
So I'm adding about one fourth a cup of clabber to two quarts of milk. And then we're just gonna cover it lightly with something to keep flies out of it and set it on the counter. Okay, now we are going to make cottage cheese. And if you remember, this is the milk that I set to ferment or clabber yesterday morning. So because I added some existing clabber, like a little bit of starter, like you would for yogurt, it only took about 24 hours for this to clabber. But when I start with just plain milk, it can take anywhere from one to five days to clabber. So what clabbered milk is, is a naturally occur uh, the naturally occurring lactic acid bacteria starts breaking down the lactose in the milk. And that changes the pH, which changes the texture of the milk. So we're going to turn this into a very healthy, full of good bacteria cottage cheese for the family. I apologize for any flies that you see in here. Um, we have been managing our flies pretty well. We don't have any animals currently in the barn except the calf, um, but we have a lot of people going in and out of the doors all day. So the, there is some flies that do come in. So when your milk is clabbered, it is going to look a little like yogurt. So we're just gonna pour it into our pot here. So you wanna heat this on a very low burner, like low and slow, because if you heat it too fast, you can change the texture of some of the curds. And I don't stir it too much because I don't wanna break up the curds too much because I like kind of a chunky cottage cheese rather than a smooth one. But you can see as this heats, how the curds and whey are separating. And we're only gonna heat it to about 110 degrees so that we don't kill any of the beneficial bacteria or so that we don't kill all the beneficial bacteria that we gained by fermenting it. So using fermented dairy is definitely not a new idea. It is the primary way that our ancestors knew how to preserve milk because fermented or cultured milk has a much longer shelf life than fresh raw milk. Fermented dairy or cultured dairy has lots of health benefits, but one of the main ones is improved digestibility. And in our family, I try to make sure that my children get a balance of fresh raw dairy and cultured dairy or fermented dairy in their diets. Okay, we were at 110 degrees and I turned the burner off and removed the curds and whey from the heat and now we're gonna strain them. So I've got my strainer here and I've got a dish to catch the whey and I'm just using a thin cotton dish towel and we're just gonna pour this curds and whey into the dish towel. Now we're just gonna let them strain for 30 minutes to an hour. So I know that you're used to seeing me make large, large batches of things for my family. And I usually cut it down for you in my printed recipes. But the reason that I have made this tiny little amount of cottage cheese is because I didn't start my milk, set my milk to clabber soon enough. And a smaller amount of milk clabbers faster. So, I knew that um, if I set a whole, you know, two gallons of milk to clabber, it's going to take like three or four days for it to clabber. So that's why I have this tiny amount of fermented um, or clabbered cottage cheese for today's video. So most often when I make clabbered cottage cheese, I find that just straining it for like 10 to 15 minutes makes it dry enough for me. 
So this is only strained like 15 minutes and it's already dry enough for me. So I'm gonna proceed to adding the cream and a little bit of salt. And then we'll have our, our fermented probiotic healthy cottage cheese. So you can eat the curds just like this. I often do and I really like them that way. Or you can add a little bit of fresh heavy cream. You can add a sprinkle of mineral salt. And there you go. There you've got your healthy cottage cheese. So normally your fermented cottage cheese made with fermented milk or clabbered milk is not going to taste tart. If you make it on the very first day that you see that it has set up like yogurt. Sometimes I have not had time that day and I waited a day or two later until my milk was very, very tart. And all that means is that all the lactic acid, all the lactose has been consumed and the lactose essentially is sugar. So all the sweetness was gone out of it. And that cottage cheese we use in baking and cooking then and not so much for fresh eating. But when we catch the clabber on the first day that it has set, it makes the best cottage cheese. Okay, real quick side note. If you're using pasteurized milk or you're not comfortable with clabbering raw milk, um, this is how you'll make cottage cheese with that milk. So this is how you'll make cottage cheese with pasteurized milk or raw milk that you don't want to clabber. You still have to acidify the milk. So um, when I clabbered it, that I raised the acid level because the lactic acid bacteria broke down the lactose and that raised the acid level. So you're gonna bypass the clabbering step and you're gonna raise the acid level of your pasteurized or fresh milk um, by adding acid. So first thing we have to do is heat it to 185 degrees. And that is essentially pasteurizing it. Another reason that you heat raw fresh milk to 185 degrees when making cottage cheese is that the heat makes the casein, no, the heat makes the protein that is in the whey available to bind with the casein protein in the milk part. And this gives you more and firmer curds to your cottage cheese. Okay, so my milk has reached 185 degrees and I have dissolved my citric acid in cool water. So now we're gonna add our citric acid to acidify the milk and that is going to help us separate the curds in a way. So once we've stirred that in a little bit, we're going to let it set until we can see that a curd or curds have formed. And I have removed it from the heat or I've turned the burner off. And I'm gonna remove it from the heat and just let it sit. Okay, so here you can see we've acidified the milk and we've got some curds forming. And you can also see that this is not near as efficient of a way to separate your curds and whey as the clabber was because what's left is not nearly as clear the milk that's left or this whey that's left is not nearly as clear as it was when I made the clabbered version of the cottage cheese. So this is the method of cottage cheese that I make using the citric acid to acidify the milk. When I want to use it for like say making lasagna or whenever I didn't plan ahead and now I need a re making a recipe that calls for cottage cheese or ricotta cheese. I use this method because it's faster. Using the clabbered cottage cheese is more of a, like you have to plan ahead and then we use it um, primarily 
as a snack because we don't want to heat that up and kill the beneficial bacteria. We just want to eat it fresh and raw. So now you're just going to strain this the same way you that I did the clabbered um, cottage cheese, but you can tell that this is going to take a lot longer to strain. And mostly it's just because it doesn't separate as well. So you have a lot of little bits that will get stuck on this um, cotton towel and prevent it from draining as fast. So like I said earlier, this is the version of cottage cheese that we use when we need it for baking or cooking. And the clabbered version, which is the highly nutritious version of our cottage cheese, we make as a dietary supplement to help our gut health. So one last thing, you might be wondering what we do with all the whey from cheese making and what about those days where you absolutely don't have time to process three gallons of milk? Well, here is what we do with extra milk. So all our whey and extra milk goes into buckets by the barn and also into those buckets goes some of our pig feed then we let this set until it's good and fermented before we feed it to the pigs or the chickens because just as cultured or fermented dairy products are good for humans it's also good for animals So if you've ever been attacked by five milk addicted 100 pound pigs, then you know exactly why I'm trying to be as quiet as possible when I give the pigs their fermented dairy products. You might also be wondering why I feed the pigs their milk inside of this livestock trailer. But this is so that when it is time to take them to harvest, they will load up without a problem. Because here again, we have learned the hard way. We have learned that it is nearly impossible to get full grown hogs to load onto a livestock trailer where they have never been before. Especially if you don't have a loading dock, which we do not have. Thank you all for watching. That concludes this week's video of June is Dairy Month. And don't forget to comment and go to the description, find the playlist of all the collaborators on this um, June is Dairy Month collaboration. And I will link all the recipes I talked about and article on using hydrogen peroxide. And until next week, we will be right here working and playing on our little corner of land and praying for rain.